Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 471 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Seth Fred Olive, and we have the full crew here this week. Kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How are you this fine Monday, Richard? Good morning, Seth. Doing well. Uh, good morning. Karloff Manor weekend, a little a little sports yeah. small <laughs> action this weekend too. So it was a good weekend. It was yeah. a good weekend. Yeah, I got to watch some tournament magic, got to watch some Super Bowl. Uh, but we'll get into all that. We also got another co-host in Graham. Good morning, Graham. How are you today? I'm good. I've been trying to hunt for the rest of my deck for a standard event in a week. Ooh, what a <laughs> the what RC. Are you, what are you playing? What flavor of control are we on? <laughs> Oh, it's fully Esper control. <laughs> oh, it's fully Esper control. It's, it's very easy because Krim always plays Demir and white is the best color. So it has to be Esper. It has to be Esper. <laughs> oh, unless I there's a Nicole wait. Bolas in standard, then it's Christmas, I think. Those That's are the, true. The rules That's of Krim true. deck building. <laughs> Uh, anyway, today we're mostly going to be talking about our first impressions of Murders at Karlov Manor. We're getting some tournament results. We had some big modern regional championships over the weekend. We want to talk about those. Uh, our experiences playing with the cards in standard and modern and whatever other formats we've been playing. So that's the main focus of the podcast. Also, maybe a little bit about a poll Mark Rosewater did about recent sets that was kind of interesting. Uh, so that's the plan for today. Before we get into it, though, a reminder that today's show is brought to you by Card Conduit. And Card Conduit's the easiest way to sell your Magic cards. And if you ever get tired of the hassles of buy listing, you can skip them with Card Conduit. You can use their curated service and send it as many cards as you want with a buy list value of a dollar or more and pay just a 5% service fee. And if you want to do a bit of work, you can use the sorted service where you list your uh, and sort your cards in advance and pay just a 2% fee. And either way, you're going to get a detailed report with the results and a fast payment once your order is processed. And you can even get another 10% off by heading over to cardconduit.com slash mtgold. Fish card conduit it's the easiest way to sell your magic cards so thank you to card conduit for supporting the show and let's talk some magic and i guess let's start with uh let's start with murders at Karlov manor so uh, easy mode Krim, what are you thinking about standard we've had the new set out for about a week so far what has your impression been especially of new cards is there anything that's like standing out is the set gonna make an impact what's your first impressions of mkm and standard I mean, first impressions is that it's like, regardless of whether or not I'm hyped on standard, right? Like, I, I think it's already made its waves, right? It's already shown that it's going to pop up. It, it made some decks are popular uh, between Legends, got some new stuff. Uh, Boros Convoke is like 90% of the ladder. Uh, and and that's all because we're seeing some some random cards like Case of the Gateway Express, War Leaders Call. These cards are popping off. The one thing that I haven't seen pop off yet is Lightning Helix, which is wild. But but <laughs> like, I, oh god, is Lightning Helix bad? Like, like, we're like, like, we're, we're oh god, it's, is, it's not bad. I think it shows up in the sideboard a little bit. Like I, I've been playing a okay. Boros token deck where I have four of them in the sideboard, and it's been really good. But it turns out that like creatures are kind of big right like three damage yeah. doesn't actually kill a lot of the stuff that you want to kill and the life gain is nice and i've certainly had some blowouts where you play against aggro and they like think they have like an alpha strike lined up and then you yeah. lightning helix in game three and it like totally ruins their day but maybe it's not as good as it was 15 years ago we haven't really seen burn right and we also haven't seen like mono red splash for it so yeah, yeah. i think yep. that the impact has been a little bit less than i expected for sure Oh, I mean, like, for, for the impact has definitely been, like, there's still moves to be made. Like, I mean, like, there's a lot of time left, right? We're still seeing, of course, I'm glad a ton of other people are also an enjoyer of the the nicer things in life. I see a lot of people playing No More Lies. Uh, that's been pretty sweet. Mana Leak is back. Uh, and, and I see others are also hyped on it as well. Uh, Gruel... Like aggro has gotten a little bit of a, a push, and we've seen a lot of like control, like blue white pop up here and there. So I kind of like it, it's subtle. It's not like the whole set kicked out everything and like makes it look like rotation, but standard is looking pretty damn good right now. I feel like so. Go ahead, Richard. I was gonna say so. If we have a feature on, on the Goldfish website, if you go to a tournament and you scroll down, you'll see all of the new Markov Mander cards being played. So you can tell, like, in the standard challenge 64, zero lightning helixes were played, including sideboard, yeah. right? That is shocking, right? And the most popular the most popular card is actually one that Krim glossed over, the greatest card of all time, Raven Inspector. 
aka <laughs> novice inspector, it's bad. at 16 copies and all in Boros aggro. Just look at these numbers, though. Like, it's bad. Markov Manor's a little underwhelming. Like, it's like a little Boros, floppy so far. Yeah, Boros got a bunch of cards in uh, Case of the Gateway Express and uh, War Leader's Call. And then everything else is just like maybe someone's ninja in a card here or there and like no real new let, decks. Let, let, let me ask up. you this. Are so, you asking know. this this set to come out and entirely wipe away the format and make it look like rotation happened? Well, D didn't I mean, we uh, have a hope so of that, that <laughs> Isn't the argument about three year standard that it leads to more diversity because you have more cards and then there's going to be all kinds of decks from all over the place because we got three years of cards now. So I feel like... I don't know, like, if sets don't make more of an impact than this, then doesn't that kind of fly in the face of the whole theory about why three-year standard is good and going to lead to more diversity? Because right now that we're looking at, like, the most played cards, like, a mana leak and a three-bin inspector, like, the, the minimal out of... There's a tournament with 114 decks. It was, uh, what was the name of this tournament? Is it Explosive Experiment Event? I don't even know what that means, but there was over 100 players in it, and the most played card was 24 copies of Novus Inspector from the new set, which Novus Inspector is great, no more lies, is second at 22 but we're not seeing like staples I mean, out of the set so far right we haven't seen anything that's gonna find itself are. at the top of the list of like best cards or most played cards in the format we see a couple on commons yeah, that are like hey i'm good in your control deck, or hey i'm a good one drop but cryptic coat we're seeing deadly cover-up like like these if we're pulling from cryptic those coat. we're we're omitting literally all the other cards that are in there right and i i'm gonna say that a it's week one and mm -hmm. two, like two weak, like we, I think if you're expecting it to rotate out Shieldra, then your, your expectations will not be met, right? Because the thing here is the cards will show up, which they are. I think they have shown up. This format is actually really good. I love the three year ext uh, extended standard because we're seeing this. We, despite Shieldreds, despite all these things, you're still seeing cards pop up. I'm not expecting the whole set of Markov Manor to take over standard. I'm ex I'm asking for like maybe five to ten cards, and it's week one, and we're already seeing five cards, right? So I I I like that. I think that that shows that uh -huh. the set has is is just one of many sets that will be a piece of the puzzle in a three year uh three year standard. But then so again, the, yeah. To Crim's point, it's week one, so anything can happen. Yep. But also, a lot of people were pulled to other formats because I would actually argue that modern had a bigger shift with Markov Manor than whatever's happening in standard. Granted, I never played, I haven't played standard. So this is all just based on tournament results, but I think a lot of people are playing modern. And then when they're bored of modern, they'll come back to standard because I think both formats had like the same amount of change in it uh, from, from the set release. So, okay. One other perspective to look at murders at Karlov Manor. And I think for me, I'm, if I add all the evidence together, I think that maybe it just points to murders being a <laughs> yeah, I'm collecting some evidence on this. Let uh, me investigate. <laughs> I think it I think it points to murders maybe just being an abnormally weak set period, because here's what really did it for me. Uh, Magic Online has what they call set redemption, right? So if you can uh, collect a complete set on Magic Online, you can pay like 20 bucks or maybe it's 25 now, and they'll take the cards and send you a physical card. So uh, a physical complete set of the cards. So normally sets on Magic Online have a meaningful amount of value just because of that, right? Because you can get the paper card. So if you look at complete sets like Lost Caverns of Ixalan, complete sets, 96 bucks. If you look at Wilds of Eldraine, uh, 76 bucks. What do you think a complete set of murders at Karlov Manor costs right now 35 bucks. bucks 35 it is by far the cheapest standards that I have ever seen right now you can go on magic online click a couple buttons 35 bucks buy a complete set 20 more bucks or whatever have it shipped to your house so if you want murders at Karlov Manor you can spend like 50 bucks and have literally a complete set of it so but, but that's pretty expected is... right because the the price is supposed to be in the fancy versions whatever the heck the fancy versions are and that is not baked into that so i think as that's, time progresses we'll see this happen more and more right that's true though but it isn't the same true of like lost caverns of ixalan or like wilds of Eldraine. the prices there are still on like the special cards too and they're worth two or three times as much as murders yeah. Karlov manor and that's with leyline being a 20 ticket card like if you don't need leyline the complete set's like 15 bucks or something on moto it's like so cheap but i've been enjoying I, standard i don't want to be bashing standard because i've actually enjoyed playing it but i do think I was hoping for more impact, but maybe like Krim said, it's because it's week one and we'll see more of an impact in the future. But really, 
none of the mythics are seeing any meaningful amount of play yeah. and even like the rares it's really the commons and uncommons that we're seeing case of the gateway express long goodbye no more lies novus inspector like we're not seeing the higher rarity cards really take off yet in standard so maybe it'll still come i'm not giving up hope on it but it's certainly been a, a muted impact so far i'd say top four cards are uncommons <laughs> like I mean, the, the, the mythics aren't pulling their weight you know they, they just can't outdo the one man of one two with the <laughs> investigate hey raven know? inspector is is actually like isn't that one wild you're magic. like raven yeah. inspector outdoing lightning helix like what i mean <laughs> like I mean, not even close <laughs> yeah not even close i mean one thing i've learned is one drops that make a trinket artifact are just really good like the blue one sees play that makes a map voldir and epicure sees play like outside of standard even is it just a one mana one one that makes a blood any of these one drops that make a trinket don't sleep on that when you see them spoiled they're probably going to be really good i mean but yeah like also the raven inspector was amazing and this is a functional reprint so you know totally makes sense and now you can play eight of them in Pauper, which is apparently a real thing. I've seen uh, Mengu <laughs> <laughs> tweeting about his Pauper eight Thraven Inspector deck doing Yo, well. Thraven so. Inspector is a modern card. <laughs> if you look at mono white control, they <laughs> they play four Thraven Inspectors. And you're like, what? <laughs> well, speaking of modern, uh, Richard, I know you've been playing modern. And then we also had this big RC that we can get into, too. But I'm curious. So uh, what are what is your first impression of this set in modern? Because I feel like as much as I've been a little disappointed in standard, like oh, I was hoping it'd make a bigger impact. I feel like maybe the set's made more of an impact than I expected on modern, actually. So what's what's MKM doing in modern, Richard? Yeah, I've been grinding a lot of modern. Me and Krim made the sweat pact. <laughs> we we got to sweat yeah. out these formats. <laughs> and uh, so so news news of the format is um, Leyline. Oh, my God. I don't know what the name of it is. Hold on. Of the Guild Pact. <laughs> <laughs> Leyline of the Guild Pact uh, is making waves in modern. And uh, if you don't know what it does, it's basically a Leyline you can put into play if, if you start with it in your hand. It makes all your lands, all the basic land types, and all your creatures uh, every color. And so the there's a two card combo happening where you play uh, Scion of Draco, Draco, which is an old domain card, right? It's it's twelve mana, but its cost reduces by two for each basic land type. So if you have domain, it costs two colorless. It's flying. It gives your creatures vigilance if they're white, hexproof if they're blue, lifelink if they're black, first strike mm -hmm. if they're red, and trample if they're green. So you basically start with the ley line in play. Pay two mana, slap this thing down. All your creatures now have uh, Vigilance, Hexproof, Lifelink, First Strike, Trample. And uh, you go to town. It's like you can't interact with it really because it's Hexproof. Uh, so initially we saw it in Zoo. Uh, so Zoo is a domain deck. You, you might as well just play this. And then Rhino players got a, <laughs> got, a, <laughs> got a hold of this. So instead of Teamer Rhinos now, there's four color variants where they basically just cut out interaction and slap in this two card combo and you go to town uh that happened that that's actually a very big deal because it's very hard to interact with so you need to kind of get ready for it and then the other big news is surveil lands are beyond broken in modern um the, you know our initial impression was like a tap land uh... who's gonna play a tap land <laughs> Right, but uh, there's plenty of times where you just fetch up the tap land. You know, you're gonna fetch a shock into play, but you don't shock it. So you might as well get the tap land. That's like a whole turn or whole extra card in modern. Uh, it's incredibly broken in things like rhinos and living end who don't curve out, uh, and even in decks that curve out, like you just when you're when you're playing off curve, you just bring it in. And then the the beautiful thing is you fetch it in, and you don't risk drawing it later in the game, where you need to actually have all your mana untapped. Uh, so most decks are playing like two, uh, two copies of, of the respective lands, and I'm playing it in a curve out deck, and it's amazing. It's <laughs> I put it in my Abzan deck, and it's like, <laughs> oh my god! It's like I I time walked my opponent. That's like a whole extra draw step. That's a that's a whole extra like card to dig for your hate piece. Uh, it dumps things in the graveyard too. It's not even just a scry, right? It dumps things into your graveyard. So Living End really loves it. Uh, same with like Murktide and stuff like that. So Modern has actually I, kind of shifted all over the place based on <laughs> Murders of Markov Manor. 
I was really surprised. So I was watching the the RC over the weekend, the one from Denver, and I was surprised just how many tap lands people were playing. You had the surveillance. You also have triomes that have kind of like developed into modern staples. So you had a lot of modern decks that are just like fetching out tap lands or just straight up playing tap lands. Their first like two turns of the game and players were so high on the surveil lands. There were people kind of like you, Richard, they were just talking about how this is literally like draw a card. Like this is pretty much like a land that I fetch out and it is the equivalent of drawing an extra card, which is is insanely powerful so yeah i think people are like sleeping on them a little bit maybe not as much anymore and we've already seen like in the just the past week the prices of a lot of these have pretty much doubled they were like two or three dollars and now we see them creeping up to like five dollars the most expensive ones are up like eight dollars so i think the surveil lands certainly are some of the sleepers from the set and we're going to see more and more of them and they should see a lot of commander play too right in commander i was kind of like i think they're good but i don't know if they're that good but seeing how good they are in modern now i'm fully like oh they got to be great in commander i'm curious about guild pack richard so you've played the most modern recently i played a bit i actually played <laughs> line of the guild pack in fact which was the it's coming up for a video on friday the deck is ridiculous uh still don't know if it's good but it is ridiculous uh i'm curious guild pack do you think this is something that has staying power? Do you think we're going to see, like, is Domain with Guild Pack the future of Domain in the format? Or do you think that the meta is going to adjust to it? I was watching Gab Nassif stream, and he was playing, like, a Crim deck, like a like a blue-white control or Esper control deck. And he was just like, I don't, I'm just playing, like, Supreme Verdicts. I don't care about this. Like, dump your hand, play your ley line. I'm just going to wrath you. Like, I don't care about any of that stuff. And it was, like, working really well for him. So do you think the meta just adjusts to this? Or is this the new, like... Tybalt's trickery, super fast, jank you out deck that's going to, like, break the format. Domain is not good enough, I don't think. So I, I think this is a great card in Domain. So you, if you want to play Domain, you, you stick this in because it actually does so much more. So I actually played some Domain with this, and uh, oh, the deck is, like, so easy. You just put this down, and you ba it's gained, like, six to eight life. Right, because when you play domain, you're like shocking yourself left and right. You're taking like a billion damage from your lands. This allows you to avoid that. It also allows you to like ley line a monkey on turn one, which is like a big deal. Uh, so it's very strong in domain. However, I don't know that it helps you in the matchups that you're losing anyway. Like living in, you're like, ah, oh, what this what's this gonna do? Nothing. <laughs> right. So like it, it helps you against like I don't know, Tarmogoyfs or something, but like I don't know that you needed that help as as a domain player. Uh, what's the more interesting take is, it, does this make Rhinos any different? And I, I feel against decks I play, this actually makes their deck worse, but maybe it shores up some matchup that I'm not aware of, and like Rhino players are split between whether this is the right build or not, because unlike domain, if you just have like Leyline on the battlefield and no Scion, like nothing happened, right? You just wasted yeah. a card and you risk drawing more ley lines. Uh, and Shouldred's Edict is a thing. Pick your poison is a thing. So if if the meta happens to be scions everywhere, like most decks can adjust for it. Just currently, they don't need to, right? Like currently you can just work around it or or whatever. You just hope they don't have it, or because there's there'll be the 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 games where they draw three ley lines, you're like, haha, good job, bro. Right? So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But it is certainly interesting. But I don't know. Does this help you against creativity? I don't think it does. Does it help you against Amulet Titan? Probably not. Does it help you against Living End? Probably not. So I, I don't know that if you play this, your deck gets meaningfully better as a zoo player or as a domain player. But we'll yeah, see. I'm... I'm skeptical of uh, of Leyline and Rhinos. Like, I don't know, just looking at the deck list. So if we go to the, the RC yesterday, the Denver one, uh, there was a couple of Rhino decks in the top eight. Actually, a team of Rhinos deck won the whole thing, but there was a domain Rhinos that made the top eight. And just looking at the deck list, I feel like it's, it's kind of like creature light for doing domain stuff. It seems like there's going to be games where like, yes, you'll have Cyanodraco into Rhinos with the guild pack out and you just like face roll for the win. But there's going to be some games where it's really bad in that deck too. So I'm not sure it's worth it there. I do think it's really good in domain though. Uh, what do you think about, so those are the big cards for modern. Uh, Surveil lands, Leyline of the Guild Pact. I don't think too much else from the set has uh, meaningfully showed up in modern yet. Some fringe stuff around the edges on Magic Online. 
Uh, did you see the RC at all? What do you think of the current modern meta, Richard? So I think the big takeaway from this RC is uh, Team of Rhinos is kind of the deck in modern, right? Or Rhinos in general. There's a, there's a mixture of versions. Some are playing the light line and going like five colors. Some are just straight up teamers. Some are four colors. But Rhinos is the deck. I know in Denver, it was like 21% of the meta going in, put a couple of players in the top eight. I think there was another RC that had six Rhino decks in the top eight you saw, Richard, which I haven't been able to find the, the deck list for that one yet. What do you think about Rhinos in modern? Is Rhinos too good is it the best deck is it a problematic deck so so the the six rhinos was actually six cascade decks i think it was like four rhinos two living oh, okay. or something but i we had this discussion before the podcast i really like modern right now i actually love rhinos <laughs> like i don't play rhinos but to me it's like splinter twin like every time i play up against it i'm like it's this weird combo deck where if they get the combo you you die but if you sell out to stop the combo, they'll kill you anyway as this like terrible teamer control deck. Uh, so I actually really like the play pattern of it. It's less oppressive than Splinter Twin, I think, because even if they do the combo, they they drop down for three mana, 10 power or eight power. You can still deal with like most decks can still deal with it, right? It's really the chaining of, of rhinos that will that will get you done. So it's like actually like a combo deck where if they combo, like you're still good to go. So I actually really like the play pattern of Rhinos. Now, Living End, that's a complete BS deck. Uh, really? And, <laughs> like, okay, Living End is stupid because you can't, it's like Dredge, right? Like you can't interact with it in a normal way. And you got to slap down like 10 graveyard hate pieces in your sideboard because you need two. One is not enough. You need two and yeah. a clock to beat them. And uh, a symptom of both decks is Violent Outburst. Right, a symptom is like instant speed. Cascade is dumb, and then all these stupid cards that cheat on mana, like Scion. Right, like they can just jam it in their deck because it doesn't affect their cascade plan. You know, yeah. like Leyline Binding. Like, yeah, sure, why not? Like, this is stupid, right? Like, they, they, <laughs> yeah, they. As soon as they pay like anything less than three mana for a card, like all the cascade cards should be exiled from their deck, and then and then it would be good to go. But I actually really enjoy Modern right now. I think. Uh, it's like super slow and grindy and fair, even though like the unfair decks exist, they do very fair things like creativity. You just you just kill the Archon. Like it's not the end of the world if you get Archon. Uh, contrast that to things like Dredge, uh, Living End is the outlier or Tron, right? Like it's very hard uh, when they get their stuff going to do anything. So I actually enjoy Modern right now. Uh, and Rhino's fantastic matchup for Tarmogoyf. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will I will dis, I will disagree on uh, on Rhinos. Oh my goodness. I I think the play pattern's horrible because it's not even really a combo, right? It's like a one card combo. All you do is cast your cascade spell. Like at least Splinter Twin you had to draw two distinct pieces and put them down. You had to do a little work. There was actually some some effort you had to put into it. This you just cast a cascade spell and it's Rhinos every time. I do think Modern is not in that bad of a place though. I think it's like definitely improve since the fury bannings and the up the beanstalk banning so i think modern is in a relatively healthy place right now which is kind of wild to say because i haven't felt like that in quite a while in modern i thought modern's been in a very unhealthy place i do wonder about rhinos though or just like cascade in general is it's just so repetitive to me it blows my mind that this mechanic that's supposed to be chaotic and you do this random thing is like plays so opposite that in a format like modern where it's actually just always living and it's always crashing footfalls crim speaking of cards that i'm curious about being busted this came up going back to standard for a minute this came up on twitter and i was thinking about it i feel like sunfall is a really problematic card what is your you're the control player what is your sunfall take like i know you love it if you're playing your control deck because it helps you win but do you think that's actually the proper power level for a wrath in standard because I feel like standard yeah. would be better if Sunfall didn't exist. Like if Sunfall was why, not why in the format. That? Because why is that? So my argument would be we have like 20 RAS in standard. So you have you can replace it with a million different things. And it really makes me sad. The thing that really made me think of it is uh, the new morph rare Yaras, I think the name is. The one that's like, oh, when your face down creatures die, you can put them back into play. And it's supposed to like be protection for your like cute. I'm going to play really inefficient two twos for three deck. And it just like sunfall and it all gets exiled and none of it matters. So I feel like the exiling aspect of it, especially because 
the creature it gives you is relevant as well. So that makes it very easy to play it as a five mana wrath even, uh, because you get a creature out of it too. I feel like it just pushes a lot of cool cards out of the meta. Kamigawa Dragons, anything that's like wrath protection, any aristocrat style deck, death, death the trigger style decks. Like all those just straight up don't exist in standard because of the exiling aspect of Sunfall. When if you played the next best wrath, you'd still kill my board, but at least maybe I could like build around it with the death trigger dragon or like some, you know, stuff like that traditional ways to fight through ass. Seth, this ain't Commander. Everybody doesn't need to have fun. So the point here is, uh, like, I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, like, uh, oh, one I, I'm going to use that quote. i got to write that down. <laughs> like, 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 the Richard the point here, from Reader's Digest. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, I'm going to be completely honest here that Seth, I think that you're right. That that idea, that philosophy is great in Commander. But I think in 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 one v one in a format where creatures just have gotten in threats, right? Just have overall gotten so good that like before, back in the days, I could let a threat resolve, deal with it later, then board wipe, right? But now this threat comes down. Everything snowballs. Everything is very powerful and very efficient. Or and then everything is resilient between all the new protection spells, all this other stuff. So naturally, the progression of sweepers would have to be power crept. We actually talked about this a while back on a podcast too, where how long until the sweepers and the removal spells catch up to the creatures and all that stuff? And you're seeing that now. Right. So we're we're seeing how sweepers are being power crept. So I think they're it's fine. I think it's great because A, I don't think it it, it people just outright lose to Sunfall. It might it might like severely hinder a game plan, but then you, you can try to rebuild. There's so many of the tier one decks that can play through a sunfall. I think control doesn't exist without a sunfall. Uh, I, I think that deadly cover up though, a sweet sweeper, it's a one of, or maybe a two of, because it's more of a tech sweeper, but then like the, the actual need to like, like control needs these, these exile sweepers just because of how good these decks and creatures are. And I'm not talking about just as a control player. I think that as also threats just get better. Sweepers need to get better answers will get better and then and then we'll just kind of do this never-ending cycle and then creatures get better than that and so like you never know i think this is wizard's fault because the only way to beat a sunfall into a farewell is burn and like aggression and the format is too mid-rangey for that to happen because like happens you can't i mean is it tier one? Like, why are people playing five yeah. six mana sweepers? Like, I, I don't know why, right? Like, apparently you can make it to five and six mana. Can you imagine, like, if you Mother go way cooks. back to the aggressive standards, like, with Shrine of Burning Rage and stuff like that, can you imagine trying to cast, like, a five mana sweeper? Like, you you just can't do that. Because we've had crazy aggro decks, and we had crazy sideboard cards. Like, timely reinforcements, whatever the new timely reinforcements is, like... You gain like a million life, make creatures and draw cards. It's like ridiculous, right? We don't have that same level of aggroness. Therefore, these five mana sweepers, you know, can can make it. And yes, if they get around removal, but wizards will fix that. Like Thrag Tusk. Like, you know, it's not when this creature dies, it's when this creature leaves the battlefield. Make this stupid thing. Uh so I'm surprised Wizards hasn't done that yet. And maybe that's because of the um the the change in rotation. But like Sunfall into Farewell is backbreaking, right? Because you're like, well, if they're going to, you know, wrath my board, let me play some artifacts or something to set up my rebuild engine or something. And it just gets Farewelled away, <laughs> right? Like yeah. you, you can't play around this and you don't have the speed to kill them. Uh, so you, what you really do is play what? Esper Midrange, right? <laughs> you you just build a board and then you have a counter spell for them. Yeah. And then therefore they, they can't Farewell and they're going to die. Right. So, but I would like to see like really aggressive aggro such that you cannot sit there on five mana wrath and like make it through. Like you, you need to actually play lower curve. Just, just look at a red deck. If you look, so, <laughs> mono, no, everything so mono red has haste. <laughs> Yeah, so Mono Red, I think, is, like, pretty aggressive. I will give it credit for that. And the, the Boros deck can be pretty aggressive. So there are a couple of decks, I think, that, like, at least 
have a reasonable shot at getting in under the Wrath. But I think if you're doing anything other than those decks, you pretty much got to be blue and black, right? I think that's the part I dislike most about Sunfall is if you look through all the like slower decks, you pretty much have to be in blue to have a counter spell to deal with the sweepers. Or maybe you can get by like being Golgari or Rakdos where you're just going to overload on like five or six discard spells in your sideboard and trust that you're just going to like uh, take them all from your opponent's hand. But like green is like completely missing from the meta essentially because of sunfall red outside of like mono red super aggro like that's kind of missing from the meta so we just see like a, even entire colors that are essentially just pushed out of standard because they just don't have a realistic way of interacting with those cards like you're so many wait, wait, cards. wait 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 wait, wait. this is magic the gathering things. since its inception right control beats mid-range aggro beats control and as a mid-range deck you want to beat control you need a thought seize out that, that sweeper, right? Like you, you inherently will get one. beaten by control, right? So I mean, yeah. this is kind of Magic the Gathering metagame in a nutshell, no? Yeah, but traditionally yeah. you can like play recursive creatures that come back from your graveyard or you can play artifacts and enchantment. Like there's other ways you build your deck to protect yourself against the sweepers. And I feel like that's just not an option when your sweepers exile and if Farewell gets involved, exiles everything. So there's not really, it minimizes the deck building fun of it for me. Like how do you how do you build your deck to play around these cards? I think the answer is out if you're not playing counters and stuff, the only realistic counterplay is creature lands i guess like those survive these sweepers and you try to like but even sunfall kind of prevents that because it makes like a 5-5 or a 10-10 so your creature lands just get blocked anyway so if, I think if, if your opponent's getting a 5-5 or a 10-10 off a of sunfall you are asking for the sunfall blow <laughs> like 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 like, like, <laughs> like what like, the, the years i don't know i mean i don't think that's necessarily like all that hard to play around right i mean you you see well i think right now rakdos is is another mid-range deck it's got a bunch of sweet threats right every the reason why the sun falls need to exist is because you have a geological appraiser you have things that just spawn another body you have uh you you have the but deep cavern bat to be disruptive there's a lot of things that can give you fight and like richard mentioned yeah, like once you sideboard into things, maybe it helps a lot more, right? Because then you sideboard into the duresses and all this other stuff, which is to thought seize things away. Uh, you have Bant Poison, which is able to, well, I mean, they just have counter spells, so that works. And they have ways to phase things out. But overall, like, I mean, they ha there's, there's something to do against everybody. And you want to talk about recursive threats? Talk about Richard's favorite modern card, Mosswood Dread Knight. Or maybe, maybe doesn't like, work against Sunfall. Like, doesn't work against Sunfall. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't work against Sunfall, but it does work against the removal and stuff like that. So then the thing here is now you hit with this Moss with Dread Knight long enough to where they're forced to have to just either A, do something about it like permanently along with that and Tenacious Underdog, or you're just going to keep clocking for three. They spend spot removal, you draw a card. Esper Midrange can obviously fight back in numerous different ways. I don't know. And then Soldiers. They don't even, like, need that many counter spells. They just have Thalia. And then that just makes everything miserable, right? So, I am i don't know. I'm can curious, I, can though, Can I do Grim. this, Seth? Can, can, I, can I skewer you? Yeah, skewer <laughs> me. Bring it. <laughs> this, 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 is, this is like a filthy casual argument when control is too good. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, this, this, when control is good, you're like... No, oh, I can't do anything. They they counterspell my threat, and then they sweep my board away. And like, I can't get anything done. I can't play any cards. Like, it's it happens every single time. Control is good, right? So yep. the only way to fix this is to make control bad. And what that means is no good counterspell, no good sweepers. Unfortunately, for all us Timmies out there. <laughs> Right now, we've got, like, literally the best ones, right? We got Mana Leak. We got Sunfall Farewell. So, Control But you have Cavern. Just... You have Cavern, which has been huge. You, like, like, I like think you see, you've got to have those. the Cavern in hand, and you have to be able to support a Cavern, whereas Control Player will always have the Counterspell or the, the, the Sweeper or, like, the Abundant Removal. Like, people already get mad from getting everything removed, right? So, like, what Seth is saying is not necessarily... Well, actually, you know, it's the same thing, right? Like, sweepers are too good, but, like, if control is too good, no one has fun. <laughs> and currently, control is too good. But, like, you control players not count? Can they never get time in the sun? You know, can they I mean, never so, have a period where their deck is legitimate? <laughs> so here's the thing. I don't, I'm not against control being good. I think it's like, if you look at the Rakdos list that came up before, as far as I can tell, 
your no witnesses or depopulates do like almost exactly the same thing as a sunfall like right like they don't have any recursive threats i guess maybe they have no, they aclazots, but they don't have any recursive threats you cast a wrath you blow up all their creatures exact same thing but because we have sunfall is the premier wrath like there's just so many cards that you can't play in this format like you just cool cards that are like mythics and hyped and we're supposed to be played and it's just like eh, no don't even think about it because you just can't so it's not like you can beat them it's not like i'm saying sunfall's unbeatable there's certainly ways to beat them it just pushes like a a reasonable chunk of cards out of the metagame even thinking about playing them you just you don't they just like it's a non-starter and Sunfall's around for another 18 months, so it will always be a non-starter. So, like, face down creatures, forget about it. It's not happening. Murders of Karlov Manor, that's why you cost 35 bucks instead of, you know, 90 bucks. Because you're built around something that just doesn't work against the meta. So, would we so rather that's... see a four-mana Wrath? Like, an actual Wrath. Like, oh, a straight-up yeah. Wrath with no... in standard. <laughs> no, no, I mean, Deep They're Pop bad. has a condition, right? Like, like just a straight-up Wrath of God, or even a three-mana Wrath versus a five-mana... Yeah exile wrath my problem is with the exiling i'd rather have toxic delusion standard honestly i'd just straight up give me a three mana wrath perfectly fine like because you can build your deck in a way that Ooh, can compete probably. with that yeah you build your deck standard. in a way that competes with it no deluge is bad i'm gonna do pay seven to yeah, kill you're gonna pay six life or something right like it's so uh, much life in, in standard to to kill something it would be getting I, I, aggro I think yeah. the thing you're not accounting for is just how good all the creatures are. Like, yeah, it, it sucks that it pushes out some things, but the thing here is creatures are so good, Seth. They have to get exiled. And do I think that there has to be they do. They do. But why do they why do you have to exile against Rakdos? Like say, or would you if you were in a just knew you were playing against Rakdos, do you play Sunfall or Depopulate? Oh, against Rakdos, I'd play Exile because then I know they can't bring it back. There's no shenanigans there. It's it's Rakdos. They always Takenuma. have <laughs> Takenuma, like Cruelty of Gix. Like there's always something to do again, right? Breach the Multiverse is obviously really good. Uh, but like, you know, that's why I just don't play win cons. Uh, but yeah, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's always something to do and it synergizes because it's a way where you're worried about closing control finishers back in the day, taking four years. But now if I actually just start spamming a bunch of like Mirex tokens and your creatures combined and I get to kill everything and exile everything. Now I can close out the game pretty much right after I wrath again. <laughs> with the 10 tens that you mocked yeah, 36, me about 36 like, well, 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 <laughs> okay. maybe you're making okay. Eryx tokens to make a 10 10 and sunfall's busted <laughs> i mean but that's only only if the sunfall plan fails which it never it rarely ever does to be honest the, uh, i mean the, these are the i don't know if this is an argument for or against but like your stabilizing cards or your control cards are also your finishers which in my books is bad like think uro it's like your ramp spell is your actual finisher. So I don't know if I like these. I guess you could have like the terrible like Awakened Lands or something. Like if you get to like nine in your wrath, you get a four four or something cool. I don't know if I like those control. Are, those are bad. You know, where their where their spells end up as their finishers. On the on the one hand, they actually finish the game. But on the other hand, like it's it's like a free roll, right? Like you don't even need to put finishers now because all your finishers are on your spells. Uh but yeah. And I'm I, surprised uh, Wizards what's, hasn't. What's addressed. wrong? I next set, I guess, we'll see Thrag Tusk. Question. Next set, we'll see Thrag I, Tusk. Where if I something mean, remo moves from the battlefield, you get something back to combat the exiling. I I hope so because I think that when it comes down to it, for me, well, we're mostly having this conversation because of the rotation changes. I think like if it was oh six months, Sunfall's gone off into the sunset, like normal standard, it would be like all right, what like whatever. You can't play these cards for the next six months because you know they printed a really good Wrath as standard. But when you look at the longevity of like three years, it's just like oh, you can't play those cards ever because Sunfall never rotates anymore. So I hope they do make some Thrag Tusks or something that gives counterplay because right now there's just a big lack of counterplay to sunfall would you ban sunfall in the interest of format diversity i would but i'm also very pro bannings like <laughs> i think we should be banning <laughs> stuff regularly to make magic you know uh, uh, like three cents worth of stuff so, right <laughs> yeah i'd be i'm i'm fine with more bannings but 
Oh, anyway, I want to do a little lightning round here. So we talked about standard, we talked about modern. There's a few other cards. I was digging around through the data, trying to see other cards from uh, Murders at Carlov Manor that have been showing up places. And I uh, wanted to just mention a couple of them. Cryptic Coat, I think, has been a card that's overperformed. Its price kind of shot up. It's seeing some standard play, even seeing some modern play in Stoneblade decks. Have you seen that at all, Richard? Have you run into the Cryptic Coat, like mini batter skull plan? So so people people are calling it true name nemesis. So it's like what is it? It's a three mana artifact. When it ETBs, you cloak, which is manifest, and then attach to it. And then your creature gets plus one plus zero and can't be blocked. And you can pay two mana to bounce it back. So you get it's like a three mana three two unblockable with like the batter skull bouncing. Uh I think it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> not not good enough. Stone, Stone Forge is not playable in modern. Stone Forge is absolutely not playable in modern. And in being an equipment doesn't mean anything because everybody deals with artifacts and enchantments nowadays. So this is not like true name nemesis cannot be deleted unless you have a sweeper or a sack, right? But this one, uh, you need to have mana up, you need to play stone forges. So I think this card is bad, but it's an option. <laughs> like you can you can try it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it really makes it in modern. What do you think about standard Grim? I've definitely seen a reasonable number of cryptic coats like on the ladders. People just like sometimes playing in an artifact deck, jamming it and just like Demir midrange, Esper midrange, like just generic decks for value. How good do you think it is in standard? Uh, I think it's actually a pretty fun card. It's a pretty sweet card. I'm trying it out right now. I'm not sure yet. I'm going to try to put, I played it in a blue white artifact deck for a, a video um, and I'm seeing people like it, it's good enough to where people are dusting off Tezzeret Betrayer Flesh, <laughs> all these like artifact things and, and, and whatnot. And it's looking pretty fun so far. Uh, I want to try it out of the sideboard for control decks, see if they can be the finisher. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like it. It's, it's a batter skull with D's instead of T's, but it is still pretty decent um, in, in standard. I just got to, we just got to see if there's actually a home for it. And uh, that that's going to be figuring out where it slots in. But it's a nice piece of a puzzle. Yeah, I mean, in the late game, it can generate a lot of value. Like once you get to that point, if if you get to the point where you don't have anything better to do, being able to bounce it and pick it up is uh, is a nice little way to keep your board going. Uh, in older formats, Pioneer in specific, Archmage's Charm has kind of taken off. I have not seen it in standard ones. I have not seen it in modern ones. But in Pioneer, it's showing up pretty heavily in Lotus Field decks and in uh, Mono Green Ramp decks, Mono Green Nykthos, uh, Devotion, Devotion <laughs> decks, which is kind of what we expected <laughs> out of it. But uh, so that one's showing up. One I really wanted to ask you about because i've seen a couple of really cool decks built around this but i haven't seen much from the actual results insidious roots i actually got crushed uh in a modern league with someone that was playing insidious roots with like grave crawler and stitcher supplier and they just like uh <laughs> it was actually and you, if what? you play tyvar <laughs> if you play tyvar you go fully infinite because you can like tap your token for a mana oh, to grave crawler yeah. and just keep doing it with a sack outlet and you make infinite plants and infinitely big creatures do you think that card has any potential, uh, Richard, or Krim in standard? Like, what do, you, what do you think of Insidious Roots? I mean, I saw somebody try to do that in standard. Um, I don't know if the pieces exist. I tried to yeah. find the pieces in standard, and it's like, oh, I'm going to graveyard trespasser myself to exile a card to make a plan. It was just super jank. <laughs> it was pretty rough. It was pretty rough. But it was cool. I think in, yeah, like the older formats, it could potentially be a combo or like a, a big piece in a green-black deck, but... It also, I don't know. I mean, it, it, if it's standard or I mean, if it's pioneer, there's a blue white's really good. So blue white will just have a clean answer to this. Uh, but in modern, maybe, maybe you'll be able to go wide because do people play a lot of sweepers in modern outside of gab? So yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's, not a, there's not a ton of sweepers, but where, uh, where are you going to say, Richard? I, I don't know about this like spicy grave crawler deck, but like Asmo, Asmo Food yep. is an actual home for this deck. And I've run into it multiple times because you have the Oval Chase Daredevil food combo. I I think that like the deck does things, but I think it suffers from the fact that everyone has all the hate cards for it ready to go. Like everyone can remove enchantments, everyone can remove graveyards. Like, why play this deck when you can just play Yawgmoth or something and actually have a chance of fighting through everything <laughs> when the graveyard hate is there? Or just play Living End if you want to be reliant on your graveyard. They actually have ways to fight graveyard hate. Uh, so I played this deck. I wasn't... So if they have the Insidious Roots and you don't deal with it, you're going to die. 
those plants are like fast and they will kill you. And they're like mana dorks as well. So they, they accelerate. So it's actually ridiculous, but you're like, I'm playing modern. I can deal with enchantments, whatever you play it. I remove it and then we keep going. And then you're playing Asmo. You like playing Asmo, right? We're, we're going to find out. Uh, so I think it, it's, it's suffering from the fact that all the sideboard hate cards hit on it anyway. And I, I think that's, that's a problem with the deck. Otherwise, normally, if the meta was just creatures and removal, then you'd be like, oh, enchantment, I can't deal with it. Can't deal with the graveyard. I'm dead. But you're like, eh, actually, you can actually deal with all of this. So it's fine. <laughs> Speaking of Yogg, that's actually one of the places it's seen play. I know Matt Nass like brought Yogg to uh, the RC and finished nine and five, but didn't make the top eight, but did well playing Insidious Roots in Yogg combo. And there's been quite a other, uh, quite a few others that are playing like a couple of copies because you got your undying creatures like coming in and out of the graveyard, your gong wolves, you got Agatha Soul Cauldron that's removing things from the graveyard. So you just get a lot of like incidental value out of playing a couple copies in Yogg. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, I think those were all of the big cards I wanted to get to, but we did have one more topic I wanted to touch on before we get to fish mail, which is uh, Mark Rosewater posted uh, some polls on his blog tag and was asking people about their thoughts on the most recent sets. I think it's the last year or maybe two years of sets. And he wanted people to rank them. I guess it's the last year of sets. So it was going back to uh, Phyrexia all will be one. One people to rank them on a one to 10 scale and a bunch of people did it. And someone on Reddit actually compiled all the data of everyone's ratings. And I thought it was pretty interesting to see overall what the, the community's perception of this was. So Krim, I don't know if you've seen this. I'm curious. What do you think was the lowest rated set in the highest rated set in the past year? First off, I for me to give you that answer, I need to know exactly what came out in the last year because I still think so. So the sets like are Amigawa Frexia, came out last Fre year. Frexia All Will Be One, March of the Machines, Lord of the Rings, Wilds of Alderaan, Lost Caverns of Ixalan, and now Murders at Karlov Manor. So those six. What sets is the, were the lowest? Ones. Which one got the most ones, which is the lowest rank, and which one got the most tens, which is the highest rank? And it may be I a think, trick question. I think Ixalan <laughs> got the most. <laughs> most love or most hate? Uh, most hate. Ooh, actually, no. Actually, Lost Cameras of Ixalan, It surprised me. Was one of the one of the most popular sets. It was actually ranked ahead of Phyrexia and March of the Machines. The most ones was actually Lord of the Rings. Seven point nine percent of people gave Lord of the Rings a one on a scale of one to ten. Really? What do you think? Yes, that. So I imagine. Well, what do you think the highest is? And then we can talk about why I think this is. What do you think got the most tens? Ah, uh, question. It it murders at Markov Manor. <laughs> no, it's it's Lord of the Rings again. <laughs> Lord of the Rings got the what? most ones and the most tens. I think there must be like eight percent of people that are just always going to downvote Universes Beyond. I think that's the eight percent that you hear like oh, on yeah, Magic Reddit that. or on like social media. It's not like most people, but there is just this this small community that is always going to downvote Universes Beyond, even when it's Lord of the Rings. Apparently, but overall, Lord of the Rings kind of crushed it it had more than almost more than double the next uh the next set as far as number of tens and it did really well across the board richard you've seen these uh these numbers what sticks out to you from this data anything okay. interesting so so the conclusion uh, actually the 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 most well-received sets were uh eldrain and Ixalot, and then followed by march of the machine and lord of the rings and then the worst sets were Phyrexia Alls 1 and Markov Manor. I'm surprised people were so down on Markov Manor. So after Lord of the Rings, as in most number of ones, you got Markov Manor uh, coming yeah. in second place. I I don't know what it is. Like, we've been to Eldraine several times. Is it the anime cards? Like, I, I don't know why it's so beloved. Markov Manor, I get. Like, I, I could see the non-existent hype. For what is Ravnica, right? Because it's like, we're going back to Ravnica. Cool, that means guilds, right? No, fool, it means clue, right? You're like, what? It means murder mystery. It means new Capenna again or something, right? Like, it's weird. Uh, so I'm not sure why. Maybe, like Seth pointed out, maybe it could be it's too soon. Maybe you're, you're going to see gems out of the set yeah. and people will love it over time. Um, and the other surprising thing is Lord of the Rings haters. Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, if, this, if this is Lord of the Rings, imagine like literally any other universes beyond. Yeah. Uh, what was the yeah, previous the numbers on Doctor Who? Oh, Doctor Who. Let's yeah. see Doctor Who. <laughs> I, I can see Doctor Who. 
being at like 25% or something as a one uh, if Lord yeah. of the Rings is this low. But, I mean, it has the most number of eight, nines, and tens or whatever too, right? So you can see it's a little uh, split. But yeah, Markov Manor, which if you just had to go on plane alone, you would say Ravnica is the most popular plane, right? But uh, apparently yeah. it's not. Yeah, I was I was surprised at how well Wilds of Eldraine and Lost Caverns of Ixalan did. And I was actually surprised at how poorly the older sets did. Because I thought, like, remember a year ago, March of the Machines, uh, Phyrexia, Invading the Universe, all that stuff. Like, that was such a huge, that was the culmination of a, a four-year storyline or something. And they really pushed that. Uh, maybe the sets, I thought those were, like, some of the best sets of the last year. But maybe they're not aging quite as well as I as I thought they did in the eyes of the community. Because I, personally, I would put March of the Machines and Phyrexia had a Wilds Eldorade and Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Just on my personal scale, I like those sets better overall. Not that I dislike Eldorade or, you know, Ixalan. But I just thought they were better sets. So I was kind of surprised to see them come in at the very bottom of the list, too. So, And I guess, like, overall... But they did pretty well, right? The lowest scoring set is Murders at Carlov Manor, but it have it had an average of six point three, and the highest was uh was Wilds of Eldorain at seven point six or seven point one six. So I I, guess... I have a theory, Seth. It has nothing to yeah. do with power level of cards, cards, planes, or anything like that. It's really the showcase treatment and the special cards. So going based off that, I would say Strixhaven is probably going to be super high on this list Ooh. because of the mystical archive and the Japanese mystical archive. But I think anime cards plus enchanting tales treatment, like the normal enchanting tales treatment plus the full art lands, like all <laughs> those were like beautiful. And I would play them all in my deck where I'm like, I don't want no stupid step and complete foil or I don't know, whatever, whatever came out of one. I don't know. And Markov Manor, like case files, like, and eh, like, yeah, they're cool gimmick, but I don't want like my staples full of case files, but I do want my staples full of enchanting tales. So I'm going to say Ooh. it's actually just purely based off the special version. And you're like anime, like, come on, it's anime, right? Like, yeah, let's go. Right. So my guess is the next time we yes. see an anime set, it's going to be a high ranking set. And the next time we see a universal treatment, like uh, Strixhaven Mystical Archive, and like say not Amonkhet Invocations, yeah. and not like, I don't know, like the Zendikar lands or whatever. Like, yeah. Like, they're not, nothing really exceptionally special. Uh, so hmm. I'm going to go based on that collector booster viability. <laughs> Interesting. You might be right. Like, I guess if you were going to rank these sets by their special treatments and special cards, these rankings probably mostly line up. Uh, I don't know where the March of the Machines and Frexia ones bad. I guess they weren't that exciting. The oil slicks are. and the oil I remember like slicks, the oil the slick language. The Phyrexian yeah. language is actually the cheapest cards of all because you can't read them. And like people need to read well, like 800 them. line cards. That re oh, <laughs> yeah, that really shows how you can have too much of a good thing because every remember when they did the judge promo at Elishnor and it was like a thousand dollar card and just like so iconic. Yeah. And then when you put it on everything, it just sort of like loses some of the specialness, I think, because I think people really like Phyrexian language before they printed a whole bunch of Phyrexian language. And now no one likes Phyrexian language cards, apparently. What about you, Grim? Which, Any... which is great. I can pick. I've been picking them up for pretty cheap, uh, because I love them, and, it, and I, I'm trying to play them in as many of my decks as I can, except for Commander, because I want you to. Be How do you even know cards, what they but... do, Grim? How do you even know what your own cards do? <laughs> uh, because you just remember them, like Shieldred. I think you know what Shieldred does. Can you imagine? <laughs> what if what if it's Flip Shieldred? You know the backside and all the saga oh, well, triggers, the scriptures. <laughs> maybe maybe we don't play that one. <laughs> maybe we don't. Can you play imagine that like one. Archdruid's charm? comes out and they have like Texas <laughs> spoil promo and you're like ah oh, this card just came out I don't know what it does like Elish That's Nord sick, is like though. an iconic card you're like okay I get it right it's so iconic that it's just ingrained in us but brand new card with sick? four modes I think about it like Cryptic Command got the textless you know you, you had you had the the Omnath of the textless the Thalia like dude that's sick I think uh, the, the streaks even the Japanese mystical archives are kind of like that for me. I have I have a they're like split cards. I have a one mana white card in my deck, and I'm pretty sure that I could go to a commander game and play it as swords or God's willing or mana type, and no one would no one would know. It's just whatever I say it is this game. What do I need? <laughs> uh, anyway, any other thoughts on uh, on the data before we get to uh, some fish mail questions? All right, Richard, why don't you fish mail us? All right, if you have questions, send them to at mtgoldfish with the hashtag mtgfishmail, and we'll get to our questions on air. 
Uh, <laughs> speaking of unreadable names, this this person's uh, Twitter name is like a random bunch of Phyrexian symbols. Uh, oh, <laughs> seven eight Phyrexian fanboy. That that's what I'm, I'm coming out with. Should okay. secret layer be printed in languages other than English? I have several decks all in Japanese, and I don't want to have only some cards in English. Ooh. I mean, sure. I yeah. Why don't they? I guess why not? They why must, do they make they boosters for other languages, but they don't make secret layers for other languages? That that part confuses me. Yeah, they even do that with some promos, right? Or like the special cards we were just talking about. They don't always show up in all languages, like the box toppers and stuff are only in English. I don't know why they don't do more of that. I mean, I guess they don't think it's worth it financially is the only thing that makes sense. I assume if they thought they were going to make money on it, they would do it. But yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I wish they would. Although maybe, I don't know. How many languages can you support? There's a lot of languages in the world. These are all oh. print to demand, though. Or I guess they stopped well, that, huh? Yeah, now they just anymore. pre-print them all. <laughs> yeah, now they pre-print them. So maybe that makes it even harder, I guess, if you got to print them ahead of time. But I wish they did at least like Japanese or some of the most popular non-English languages. Just print everything at the same direction. time, I don't know. I can't feel bad for Japanese players because Japanese players get all the coolest promos. Like every month, I feel like there's some super epic promo that pops up, but it's only only in Japan. I'm like, but that's oh, literally how that the rest really of the world on. feels on every secret layer and every death release. I like, oh, look at all these free cards, and I can't and I can't even buy them. I gotta pay like eighty million dollars shipping or whatever if you want yeah. the English version. Oh yeah, <laughs> the like, brutal. The shipping is so brutal for for a billion dollar global company like we we sure are pretty scuffed at handling global players and one way to grow the game is to grow in a market where the game doesn't exist like if yeah. you break into china you're like free money right like there's so much money sitting there but i don't know why we're so u.s centric if you're trying to expand the player base like print other languages sell them in other countries and, and grow the game there it's like easy right I mean, that's what you see all the big sports leagues doing, right? Like the NBA, NFL, they're all about like trying to break into China or like posting games in Mexico City, like doing all this stuff to get in other markets. So, yeah, Magic could probably do a lot more of that, honestly. OK, uh, the Grachi brothers, you spoke about return sets in the last cast. How come we haven't returned to Tarkir yet? That's got to be on the roadmap. Did right? Tarkir blow up or something? Is there any like story reason why we can't do it? I, I, I think, didn't they go back in time and, like, fix Tarkir? So, like, oh. Tarkir's all good, right? Like, so, the, like, whatever, cons of Tarkir was if the Dragon Lords, I think, won, right? And then, and then, wait, what, yeah. What, what, and then what Dragons of Tarkir. Tarkir. Dragon Lords? Yeah, Dragon, Dragon Lords. Was that Siege Rhino? On... Did Siege Rhino come yeah, from Tarkir? Yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> so, oh. then they, the last set of the Tarkir block, they went back back in time i think and that's why sarkhan was on nexus of fate or something like that and then he kind of and then if you remember like dismal backwater when they went back to the third uh, tarkir set or they did the third tarkir set dismal backwater and those lands the art changed it's a subtle change but like the original dismal backwater has like all the dragons dead or whatever the I'm human so dead. I'm so my Crim's knowledge of I, magic yeah. story here. I, my mind is yo, blowing. My <laughs> yo, he he is right though. The the Wikipedia actually backs him up. There's like two timelines and one where the yeah, dragons rule, yeah. another one they're not. So Crim's actually like kind of nailing it. Although it was invaded during the Phyrexian invasion last year, so I think it still exists, or at least it oh, did yeah. as of like Phyrexia a year ago. So it seems like it would be possible because we got like Sorak and Gore Claws or going Ojitai. Those are the cons like members that were fighting against the Phyrexians. So I imagine we'll go back to it at some point. We Although got honestly, we got a lot of new sets coming up, which is good. I'm hyped for going to new planes over return planes at this point because I feel like we've done a lot of returning in the last few years. All right. Yeah, that's T fair. And uh, one more question from Taylor Gamble. With 60-card paper constructed participation arguably at an all-time low, should Watsi start including shock triomes and a fetch in every commander precon to lower the financial barrier of entry into formats like Modern and Pioneer? So I was actually looking at the price of Bloodstained Mire this weekend. That thing is over $30. <laughs> like yeah a, a ractos fetch land like so high like blows my mind what if we just made everything like free <laughs> what if we just printed them into the ground i mean 
I feel like Modern Horizons 3 might fix this pretty well because the ones that they reprinted in Modern Horizons 2, you can still get like Arid Mesas and March Flats for like 10 or 15 bucks. They like drop so much, but they didn't haven't reprinted the ones that were in cons yet. So maybe they can do it that way. Like obviously overall, it would be great for it would be great for us as players if dual lands were uncommon rather than rare or if they reprinted them into the ground. I don't think Watsi sees it that way, though. I, I think Watsi, uh, they've even talked specifically about how they feel like they need the lands at rare to be able to like sell booster boxes and sell sets. So I don't expect that change to happen. But yeah, it would be great if it did. Hear me out. One Piece gives out some banger cards that when you go out to play their events, right? We're talking like their, their nationals, uh, stuff like that. The only thing they did right was that they gave away uh, like a promo pack like three of them or so, two of them. And let's just say roughly at the time, it was like maybe $400 worth of stuff wow. just in, in packs, right? So now if Magic did that, where we they could they just print it, it's not like it costs them anything more. They just print these lands and you can get your random assortment and you can get GP or whatever Magicon stamped lands. Uh, and they can be fetches, they can be shocks, they can be any of those two out at their events. That'd be huge, right? Yeah, like just give those out to your at your events. You get people to go out to your events. Um, there's still the randomness. There's like you know like the, which shock do they people want? It kind of sparks the trading conversations and talking to others at your store or your events and getting to know more of the community and stuff like that. So I don't know. I don't know why they just don't do that. You go to F and M, you get a different shock land, right? Or you get a shock land in ten weeks. Uh, you can get all the shock lands, and then you get the fetch. Well, it, it'd be random. Right. It'd be random. It'd yeah, but you could trade for it, right? Like if everyone, yeah, is yeah, going, yeah. But that would get you to go to your LGS. That would get you to play Paper Magic. And you know what? When you have all of these lands, you might be like, oh, I can build a new modern deck now. It's cheap, and cheap is still two hundred dollars worth of mythics. But you know, you're you're gonna spend yeah. that money. I I don't know why they don't give this away. They used to do this, right? If you go back to the original Magic Player rewards, those were good cards. Right, those yeah. were oh, like part, yeah. actual playable good cards, unlike the random, you know, tier four standard card you get when you get you know a promo nowadays. Right, like just give us eternal playable card and just just take the loss. Right, like you're going to just take the loss Not on the fetches and shocks, and you can make triumphs expensive, whatever. Right, you can make surveil lands expensive, whatever. Right, like just just over time, like give players the thing. Like the the thing I hate most is no matter how long you played Magic, you don't make any progress. Like, it should yeah. be free to play friendly in that if I play three years of Magic the Gathering, I should have progress on my collection without spending additional money. And that would be through participation at Grand Prix and uh, FNM and things like that. So I don't see why we can't just, like, slow drip out the lands to players. And lands are true staples, right? They're, they're used in every format, uh, every color decks. Like, if you give out, say, a Cryptic Command, that only works for control players, right? Uh, but... A, a fetch land is universal so i would definitely like to see that free cards better promos yeah. would help promos have gone way worse haven't they i feel like they're they, they do sometimes like the chase uncommons but it's been a while since we've had a like cryptic command style like super high-end constructed playable promo that's uh, not a not uncommon so what, more what's he needs a rebuilding promo. year that's what they need they need to be like look next year our our profits are going to stay the same or decline slightly, but we're setting up for the future. <laughs> we're setting up for oh the God. future, right? So we're going to give up Bloodstained Myers and we're going to win the Super Bowl anyway. Like, that's what we need to do. We need to have rebuilding year for Watsi yeah. to just get these free cards out, juice up the player base, and then you can go, like, take everyone's money with secret layers and stuff <laughs> next year. Like, we, we got to give out the free cards. I don't know I don't if they got it in Lots of money. Like in reality, right? Like it's like it's not like you just make these F and M promos, like I don't know, sketch drawings or stick figure like drawings of lands, right? And then you can get people with, I guess, then like the fancy versions of the lands. You also have like the the like like modern when when the lands were on sale, the cost of like all the cards that people want to play in the decks that they're using the lands in went up. So it's not like they're gonna like lose that much and whatnot. There, make make them white bordered so you get a dick. Yeah, make them white bordered. Then you're like, I gotta replace them. I gotta replace them. Yeah, the real versions after. I mean, I'm I'm gonna actively try to go get all white border ones. <laughs> but yeah, like, like yeah, like I, they they could. It's not like they're losing out on anything, right? They they they're all they're doing is growing their player base, getting more people out to paper events. All right, so that's our fish mail for this week. If you have questions, send them to at MG Goldfish with the hashtag MG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. 
And I believe that brings us to the end of episode 471 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So Richard Cram, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we'll be back next week to talk about whatever goes on in the world of magic. So until then, have an amazing week, everyone. And this is the crew signing out.